This episode is brought to you by the Complete Concussion Management Continuing Education Platform, more specifically, the Level 1 course, Introductory Concussion Management for Healthcare Professionals. This course dives into the pathophysiology of acute concussion and covers all the things that happen inside the brain immediately upon impact and during the days and weeks that follow. We dive into metabolic dysregulation, blood flow impairments, autonomic nervous system dysfunctions, and heart rate variability, and much more. This course also examines the biomechanics of injury, looking at subconcussive impacts, as well as concussions themselves. We explore the research around concussion prevention protocols, and in particular, take a really close look at neck strengthening protocols to examine the scientific evidence in support, or potentially against these programs. In the final module, we take a very close look at chronic traumatic encephalopathy, otherwise known as CTE. This is the long-term neurodegenerative disease that's thought to be attributed to concussions or repetitive head trauma. And we take a very in-depth look at the evidence uh, around this, and we try to separate media hype from the actual scientific literature. This allows you as a healthcare professional to be able to answer your patient's questions more clearly and appropriately with the best evidence in mind. This course is meant for healthcare professionals, but is no means excluded to healthcare professionals. We actually made this course open to anyone, although the majority of people who are going to be interested in taking it are going to be healthcare professionals, and we do discuss things at a very, very high level for healthcare professionals, but we also know that there's a lot of people who are seeking information for themselves personally or for their family members or loved ones who currently have concussions and just want to learn more about the topic. By all means, you are also welcome to take this course. So please click the link below in the show notes for the level one course. Hello everyone and welcome to episode number 75 of Ask Concussion Doc. I am your host, Concussion Doc, aka Dr. Cameron Marshall. <laughs> Uh, just an, a quick announcement. Um, I've set up a link in my bio. Um, actually, I haven't yet, but I will right after this. I've set up a link in my bio uh, for a concussion seminar series that we are running for healthcare professionals. We've done this now um, probably two or three weeks, and um, the feedback has been tremendous. We've had a lot of people take part in it. Uh, it's been awesome. Our goal at CCMI is to uh, continue to help as many concussion patients as we can. And the best way for us to do that is to try and educate more healthcare professionals. A lot of the research in the concussion space is showing that some of the best forms of treatment for patients with persistent concussion symptoms is rehabilitation. So our mission right now is to make sure that all the rehabilitation professionals that we can get our hands on have the additional training and knowledge that they need in order to be able to help more patients. We get messages from all over the world from patients looking for clinics in their area that are CCMI certified. And we're on a mission to try and provide CCMI certified clinics in every region of the world so that patients can benefit and go to a healthcare practitioner that has uh, more advanced training in this area. So if you haven't yet taken part in the workshop, I encourage you to do so. For those listening on the podcast or on the YouTube channel, there will be a link in the show notes. For those watching live right now, I will put the link in my bio on Concussion Doc. So for those watching on Complete Concussions, make sure you go over to Concussion Doc and I'll put the link in there to register for that workshop. Uh, we have a few time slots available this week, uh, and we may run it again, but it's getting close to Christmas time, so time is getting scarce. Uh, okay, so for those that are concussion patients right now, don't worry, we're in the process of setting something up for you as well, some resources and stuff to help you develop uh, some more strategies around being able to um, help mitigate your symptoms if you don't necessarily have a clinic in your area. So we're trying to put together a workshop for our patients as well because we know that there's limited resources for you in a lot of places. So without further ado, let's get into the podcast episode. Today's episode is on the biomechanics of concussion. We've tried to do this now for the past couple of weeks, but other things keep coming up along the way. And so we've had to push it back. So we're finally getting to the topic of biomechanics of concussion. And really what I want to dive in today, into today are the forces required for concussion injuries and what else might be going on under the surface when concussion injury happens. 
All right. Okay. Let's dive into it. So the old theory of concussion, what was called, it was called the coup contra coup injury. So the theory for how a concussion injury happened would be the brain hit the inside of the skull and bounce back and hit the back part of the inside of the skull. So you'd have the injury on the front part called the coup, brain hits the skull, bounces back, and then it hits the other part of the skull and that's the contra coup injury. And if you Google concussion, you'll still see this mechanism described as the coup contra coup injury. And what you'll see is a picture of a bruise and the bruising is on the outer part of the brain. And so concussion was often described as this bruising of the brain. Now, the new theory around how concussion happens is actually a stretch or shear theory. So the brain now, the way that we think about it is the brain, if you consider the brain to be kind of like jello, and as the brain gets impacted, it will shake. And if you look at, if you picture jello shaking back and forth, if I'm to zoom in on every little jello strand within a pile of jello, you're going to see those strands get stretched out. So that's the theory now behind concussion is it's not so much a bruise to the outer part of the brain, but it's when the brain gets stretched and jiggles back and forth, you get stretching of those brain cells, which then causes what's called an ion exchange. When the brain cells get stretched out to a significant enough degree, there's little pores in the membrane of each brain cell. And those little pores, when they get stretched open, there's little ions inside the brain cell and there's little ions on the outside of the brain cell and those ions exchange with one another. That little exchange causes excitation of the impacted brain cells. So really what you have is the impact, which then jiggles the brain. The jiggling of the brain stretches the brain cells out. And as soon as they get stretched out to a significant enough degree, the stuff that's inside goes out and the stuff that's outside comes in and that creates stimulation and then the brain starts going undergoing what's called action potentials where it starts to fire. This might cause some, some people to go unconscious. This might cause you to see stars, right? It's, you're not seeing stars. You're seeing random discharge of you know, ions transmitting and, and axons firing in your visual cortex that makes you see stars. You might be off balance. You might be a little bit dazed and out of it. But that's kind of what happens in concussion. It's this electrical storm that happens inside the brain. So now what I'm talking about is the biomechanics. How much force is required to cause that stretching? Right, Because of it's acceleration, if I hit myself like this, my brain is not accelerating to a significant degree. So this is not going to give me a concussion. But if I really get hit and my head whips back and forth, I'm going to get that stretching. And when that stretching happens, that's when the ion exchange happens. So what we've been looking for for years in the research world is what is a threshold for concussion? When does concussion happen? And that's the topic of biomechanics of concussion. When do concussion injuries happen? A lot of the questions we get from patients and a lot of the concerns I have from my own patients are the little impacts, right? They have a concussion and now anytime they go over a speed bump, they freak out because they think they've had another concussion. But what I'm going to explain to you today is that there's a lot more force required to cause concussion injury, okay? So concussion, key point is caused by acceleration of the brain. Hits to the head don't cause concussion. Acceleration of the brain causes concussion. So you don't even have to be hit in the head to get a concussion, but if you have a significant whipping motion of your head, you're gonna get motion of the brain, which can then stretch it and cause the ion exchange. All right? Okay, so how much force is required to cause a concussion? The majority of the research that's done in this space has been done in football players using what's called instrumented helmets. They take little accelerometers, and they put them all inside of a football helmet. And then they have athletes wear those helmets throughout a, a period of time. Usually it's over a season or over several seasons. And they're, look, they're looking at every single hit that that player takes. And every single hit that that player takes, they're looking at the rotational component, the linear component, all the different uh, acceleration vectors that could be included within any type of impact that's all getting recorded into a computer system on the sidelines. So these instrumented helmets are usually using a, a technology called the HIT system, which is called Head Impact Telemetry, H-I-T. It's the HIT system. So these helmets, there's six accelerometers inside these helmets, and they're all multidirectional. So they're triaxial accelerometers to measure all these different degrees of freedom and ranges of motion within the brain. Or, sorry, not within the brain, within the helmet. Now, the argument can be made that the helmet is not the head. 
right? Because sometimes the helmet can get hit and undergo a lot of acceleration and the head stays still underneath it because the helmet is a little bit loose or doesn't fit quite tightly enough to the head. So there's there's a there's some controversy around that that it's probably not the most accurate reading, but it's currently the best system that we have because you can put a lot of accelerometers that have a lot of um, you know good sensitivity and you can put them inside this inside these helmets without affecting uh, things too much. So it's a good way to do it. Uh, it's probably not an exact measurement, but it's you know good enough. Okay, so. Uh, a researcher by the name of Broglio, Stephen Broglio, started a lot of this research and kind of pioneered a lot of it. Uh, in 2016, there was an author by the name of Brennan, and he did a systematic review and a meta-analysis of all the impacts that have been included in these studies. There was 1.5 million impacts. And usually the way they measure this is they only measure impacts with an acceleration value of greater than 10 Gs. Okay, a G is the force of gravity. To put that in perspective for you, how much is the force of gravity? Well, a sneeze is about three and a half Gs, give or take, to the head. So they're only recording impacts that cause acceleration of greater than 10 Gs. So after 1.5 million impacts over several seasons in high school and college football, there was 321 documented concussions. So 1.5 million impacts, 321 concussions. That means that the rate of concussion in football is 0.02%. Less than 1% of all impacts in the sport of football cause concussion injury. All right. So let's keep that in perspective. Think about watching a football game and the amount of impacts that are happening and the magnitude of those impacts. Less than 1% of them are actually resulting in concussion injury. So the next time you go over a speed bump, try to think, was that enough force to cause concussion injury? Was that, was that in the upper 99 you know, percentile of football impact? That's kind of how you have to think about this. The mean peak linear acceleration that was found to cause concussion injury was 98.68 Gs. 98.68 Gs. So remember, a sneeze, a chew, is three and a half Gs. If you're in a car accident, your airbags are set to deploy at a change of velocity of 50 kilometers an hour or 30 miles an hour for our American friends. 30 miles an hour. So if you're driving down the street, 30 miles an hour, and you ram into a telephone pole. You're going to get a change of velocity of 30 miles an hour. That's going to cause your airbags to go off. Biomechanical studies looking at the amount of force in that, the amount of G-forces in that, find that through the seat belt, through the chest, that's about 60 Gs. All right? The mean peak linear acceleration for concussion injury was 98.68 Gs. The range of concussion was between 82 and 115. So let's again put that in perspective. Car accident, boom, airbags, seatbelt, 60. Concussion injury, mean peak linear acceleration, 98. All right, so it's a tremendous amount of force that causes concussion injury. Rotational acceleration, I don't have any rotational comparisons because rotational acceleration is measured in uh, rads per second squared, which is, I don't know, tough to put a, put, put a quantification on that or use an example on that. But rotational acceleration, the mean peak rotational acceleration was 5,700 rads per second squared and the range was, was between 4,500 and 7,000 rads per second squared. Now let's look at different sports. Football. The average middle school football player takes between takes 252 hits to the head per season 252 hits to the head per season most people are looking at it and going holy crap that's a lot of hits but remember we're only measuring hits that are over 10 g's and for concussion range we're looking at 98 g's okay average high school football player takes 652 hits to the head registering over 10 g's per season. The average college athlete can take anywhere from 300 all the way up to 1400 hits per player per season. Now the reason why there's such a range is probably because you have some players that don't play a lot and they're only on practice squad. So they're probably getting less than the players that are playing every game as well. All right. 
Now, the average impact in high school football is 23, between 23 and 25 Gs. In fact, 77% of all impacts in high school football are below 30 Gs. So well below the threshold for concussion. In college football, the average impact is 22 Gs. Again, well below the threshold for concussion. That's why not every play you're seeing concussed athletes, right? Hockey. In bantam and midget, so this is between grade 8 and grade 12. Uh, also, uh, if you want to look at ages, between 13 and 18. Um, now, they found that there's 223 hits per player per season. The mean impact magnitude, only 18 Gs. So again, well below concussion threshold. The average impact players are getting is about 18 Gs when they do get hit. Well below concussion threshold. So it's a very small percentage that are leading to concussion injuries. Soccer headers. The average header in a soccer game is for under 14-year-old girls, 20 Gs. For university girls, 20 Gs. Again, you're seeing that it's the same because in university, the balls are coming faster, but the girls are also bigger, stronger. So when the ball hits, you're getting the same level of Gs as you would if you're looking at under 14-year-old girls because the ball is not coming as hard, but they're also weaker, so they're taking the same amount of force. It's 20 Gs in both scenarios. So there's this big push around the world to ban heading in soccer because of the concussion thing. The problem is that not very many concussions happen because of heading the ball. The average header is 20 Gs. That's well below the threshold for concussion injury. And in, uh, in 2015, an uh, author by the name of Comstock did a study that looked at the highest causes of concussion and found that contact, player-to-player -player contact, was the highest cause of concussion and resulted in 70% of the concussions that boys get in soccer and 51% of the concussions that girls get in soccer are the result of player-to-player -player contact. Heading the ball caused less than 10% of all concussions in high school soccer, right? Because the forces are actually quite low in headers. So is heading, is banning heading going to really impact the concussion problem? Probably not. It's when you get a bunch of people all running around the field chasing the same object that people are going to run into each other and you're going to get player to player contact. And that's where the concussion injuries are occurring. This is also why the idea behind soccer headgear is not is kind of a joke. Soccer headgear has not been shown to reduce concussion risk in any way. And it's probably because it's not coming from heading, it's players hitting each other and then their heads whipping back and forth and the brain moving inside the skull. You can wrap whatever you want on the outside of the head and it's not necessarily going to reduce the acceleration of the brain inside the skull. Okay? Now, I've been talking about high school and college because that's where most of the data is. How about kids? Do kids have the same level of magnitude of impact before getting a concussion injury? Do they get concussed with the same forces? Now, there's not a ton of research on this, but just last month, November 2019, there was a study that came out published by um, Campolitano. Campolitano and colleagues published a study in the Annals of Biomedical Engineering and they looked at kids age 9 to 14 years old. Now, there was only 15 concussions included, so it's still a very, very small sample size. But what they did find is the, that the average linear acceleration was only 62 Gs. So remember, the average acceleration to cause concussion in a high school or college age athlete was 98 Gs. In 9 to 14 year olds, what they found was the average magnitude was 62 Gs. And the range was actually between 35 and uh, 95. So younger kids may be getting concussed with less force, but this is an early preliminary study. So we don't actually know we need just more research in this area. And actually we're including this study in this month's concussion chronicles. So for those that don't know, concussion chronicles is something you can sign up for. We go through all the research every single month. We take the top three studies that are done every single month and we summarize them and synthesize them and we send them right to your inbox. So if you want a copy of that, we're releasing this one on Wednesday, along with two other studies that are included. If you haven't signed up yet for Concussion Chronicles, you can do so by going to completeconcussions.com slash resources. You click on the resources tab and you scroll down to Concussion Chronicles and sign up there. And then every single month, uh, it's usually the second Wednesday of every month, you get um, the latest concussion research delivered right to your inbox.
Okay, now, now that I've talked about the amount of forces, how can we mitigate those forces? What can we do to reduce our concussion risk? Well, you're going to have to wait till next week because that is going to be our topic for next week. So join us here next week when we talk about helmets, mouth guards, the Q collar. For those of you in Canada, maybe you watched the CFL Grey Cup and you saw a lot of players wearing this thing on their neck. We'll talk about that. We'll also talk about neck strengthening programs and more. What can we do to mitigate the acceleration forces happening inside the head? That's it for me. Thank you for joining us. Whoa, wait, 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 wait. Just one more thing before you go. This episode is brought to you by the Complete Concussion Management Clinical Network. Are you suffering from concussion symptoms that just aren't getting better? Maybe you're in the wrong place. Maybe you're seeing the wrong healthcare professional. Visit completeconcussion.com slash find dash a dash clinic to find all the local professionally trained concussion rehab individuals in your area. Each of our partnered clinics have gone through extensive training on concussion assessment, management, diagnosis, treatment, and rehabilitation. Uh, they're going to work with you to try and find the root cause of your symptoms and then develop a treatment plan and approach to help get rid of them. If you don't know what's driving the symptoms, you can't ever help or hope to fix them. CompleteConcussions.com slash find a clinic. They have a 98% patient satisfaction rating and have a higher net promoter score than Amazon, Apple, and Netflix. CompleteConcussions.com slash find a clinic. You will not regret it.